how to succeed, or stepping stones to fame and fortune. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tech Savvy. How to Succeed or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune by Orson Sweat Marden. Chapter 2. Seize Your Opportunity. The blowing winds are but our servants when we hoist the sail. You must come to know that each admirable genius is but a successful diver in that sea whose floor of pearls is all your own, by immersion. Who waits until the wind shall silent keep, who never finds the ready hour to sow, who watcheth clouds will have no time to reap, by Helen Hunt Jackson. The secret of success in life is for a man to be ready for his opportunity when it comes. By Israeli. Do the best you can where you are, and when that is accomplished, God will open a door for you and a voice will call, Come up hither into a higher sphere. By Beecher. Our grand business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. By Carol. When I was a boy, said General Grant, my mother one morning found herself without butter for breakfast, and sent me to borrow some from a neighbor. Going into the house without knocking, I overheard a letter read from the son of a neighbor, who was then at West Point, stating that he had failed in examination and was coming back home. I got the butter, took it home, and without waiting for breakfast, ran to the office of the congressman for our district. Mr. Hammer, I said, will you appoint me to West Point? No, is there, and has three years to serve. But suppose he should fail, will you send me? Mr. Hammer laughed. If he don't go through, no use for you to try, you lie. Promise me you will give me the chance, Mr. Hammer, anyhow. Mr. Hammer promised. The next day the defeated lad came home, and the congressman, laughing at my sharpness, gave me the appointment. Now, said Grant, it was my mother's being without butter that made me general and president, but he was mistaken. It was his own shrewdness to see the chance, and the promptness to seize it, that urged him upward. There is nobody, says a Roman cardinal, whose fortune does not visit once in his life. But when she finds he is not ready to receive her, she goes in at the door and out through the window. Opportunity is coy. The careless, the slow, and the observant. The lazy fail to see it, or clutch at it when it has gone. The sharp fellows detect it instantly, and catch it when on the wing. The utmost which can be said about the matter is that circumstances will and do combine to help men at some periods of their lives and combine to thwart them at others. Thus much we freely admit, but there is no fatality in these combinations, neither any such thing as luck or chance, as commonly understood. They come and go like all other opportunities and occasions in life, and if they are seized upon and made the most of, the man whom they benefit is fortunate. But if they are neglected and allowed to pass by unimproved, he is unfortunate. Charlie, says Moses H. Grinnell, to a clerk born in New York City, take my overcoat tip to my house on the Fifth Avenue. Mr. Charlie takes the coat, mutters something about I'm not an errand boy. I came here to learn business, and moves reluctantly. Mr. Grinnell sees it, and at the same time, one of his New England clerks says, I'll take it up. That is right. Do so, says Mr. G. And to himself, he says, That boy is smart. He will work. And he gives him plenty to do. He gets promoted gets the confidence of businessmen, as well as of his employers, and is soon known as a successful man. 
The youth who starts out in life determined to make the most of his eyes and let nothing escape him which he can possibly use for his own advancement, who keeps his ears open for every sound that can help him on his way, who keeps his hands open he may clutch every opportunity, who is ever on the alert for everything which can help him to get on in the world, who seizes every experience in life and grinds it up into pain for his great life's picture, who keeps his heart open that he may catch every noble impulse and everything which may inspire him, who will be sure to live a successful life. There are no ifs or ands about it. If he has his health, nothing can keep him from success. Zion's Herald says that Isaac Rich, who gave one million and three quarters to found Boston University of the Methodist Episcopal Church, began business thus. At 18, he went from Cape Cod to Boston with three or four dollars in his possession and looked about for something to do rising early, walking far, observing closely, reflecting much. Soon he had an idea. He bought three bushels of oysters, hired a wheelbarrow, found a piece of board, bought six small plates, six iron forks, a three-cent pepper box, and one or two other things. He was at the oyster boat, buying his oysters at three o'clock in the morning wheel them in three miles, set up his board near a market, and began business. He sold out his oysters as fast as he could get them, at a good profit. In that same market, he continued to deal in oysters and fish for 40 years, became king of the business, and ended by founding a college. His success was won by the industry and honesty. Give me a chance, said Halliburton's stupid, and I will show you. But most likely he has had his chance already and neglected it. Well, boys, said Mr. A, a New York merchant, to his four clerks, one winter morning in 1815. This is good news. Peace has been declared. Now we must be up and doing. We shall have our hands full but we can do as much as anybody. He was owner and part owner of several ships lying dismantled during the war, three miles up the river, which was covered with ice and an inch thick. He knew that it would be a month before the ice yielded for the season, and that thus the merchants in other towns where the harbors were open would have time to be in the foreign markets before him. His decision, therefore, was instantly taken. Reuben, he continued, addressing one of his clerks, go and collect as many laborers as possible to go up in the river. Charles, do you find Mr. Blank, the rigger and Mr. Blank, the sailmaker, and tell them I want them immediately. John, engage half a dozen truckmen for today and tomorrow. Stephen, do you hunt up as many gravers and conquerors as you can and hire them to work for me? And Mr. A himself sallied forth to provide the necessary implements for ice breaking. Before 12 o'clock that day, upward of an hundred men were three miles up the river, clearing the ships and cutting away ice, which they sawed out in large squares. And then thrust under the main mast to open up the channel. The roofing over the ships was torn off, and the clatter of the calkers, mallets, was like to the rattling of a hailstorm. Loads of rigging were passed up on the ice. Riggers went to and fro with belt and knife. Sailmakers busily plied their needles and the whole presented an unusual scene of stir and activity and well-directed labor. Before night, the ships were afloat and moved some distance down the channel, and by the time they had reached the war, namely in some eight or ten days, their rigging and spars were aloft, their upper timbers caught, 
and everything ready for them to go to sea. Thus Mr. A competed and on equal terms with the merchants of open seaports. Large and quick gains rewarded his enterprise, and his neighbors spoke depreciatingly of his good luck. But as the writer from whom we get the story says, Mr. A was equal to his opportunity, and this was the secret of his good fortune. A Baltimore lady lost a valuable diamond bracelet at a ball, and supposed it was stolen from the pocket of her cloak. Years afterward, she walked the streets near the Peabody Institute to get money to purchase food. She cut up an old, worn-out, ragged cloak to make a hood of. When lo, in the lining of the cloak she discovered the diamond bracelet. During all her poverty she was worth $3,500, but did not know it. Many of us who think we are poor are rich in opportunities if we could only see them, in possibilities all about us, in faculties worth more than diamond bracelets, in power to do good. In our large eastern cities, it has been found that at least 94 out of every 100 found their first fortune at home or near at hand and in meeting common everyday wants. It is a sorry day for a young man who cannot see any opportunities where he is, but thinks he can do better somewhere else. Several Brazilian shepherds organized a party to go to California to dig gold and took along a handful of clear pebbles to play checkers with the, on the voyage. They discovered after arriving at Sacramento, after they had thrown most of the pebbles away, that they were all diamonds. They returned to Brazil only to find that the mines had been taken up by the others and sold to the government. The richest gold and silver mine in Nevada was sold for $42 by the owner to get money to pay his passage to other mines where he thought he could get rich. Professor Agassiz told the Harvard students of a farmer who owned a farm of hundreds of acres of unprofitable woods and rocks and concluded to sell out and try some more remunerative business. He studied coal measures and coal oil deposits and experimented for a long time. He sold his farm for $200 and went into the oil business 200 miles away. Only a short time afterward, the man who bought the farm discovered a great flood of coal oil, which the farmer had ignorantly tried to drain off. A man was once sitting in an uncomfortable chair in Boston, talking with a friend as to what he could do to help mankind. I should think it would be a good thing said the friend, to begin by getting up an easier and cheaper chair. I will do it, he exclaimed, leaping up and examining the chair. He found a great deal of rattan thrown away by the East India merchant ships, whose cargoes were wrapped in it. He began the manufacture of rattan chairs and other furniture, and what has astonished the world by what he has done with what was before thrown away. While this man was dreaming about some far-off success, he at that very time had fortune awaiting only his ingenuity and industry. If you want to get rich, study yourself and your own wants. You will find millions of dollars, have the same wants, the same demands. The safest business is always connected with men's prime necessities. They must have clothing, dwellings they must eat. They want comforts, facilities of all kinds for use and pleasure, luxury, education, culture. Any man who can supply a great want of humanity, improve any methods which men use, supply any demand or contribute in any way to their well-being, can make a fortune, but it is detrimental to the highest success to undertake anything merely because it is profitable. If the vocation does not supply a human want, if it is not helpful, if it is degrading, if it is narrowing, don't touch it. A selfish vocation never pays. If it belittles the manhood, blights the affections, 
dwarfs the mental life, chills the charities, and shrivels the soul, don't touch it. Choose that occupation, if possible, which will be the most helpful to the largest number. It is estimated that five out of every seven of the millionaire manufacturers began by making, with their own hands, the articles on which they made their fortune. One of the greatest hindrances to the advancement and promotion in life is the lack of observation and the disinclination to take pains. A keen, cultivated observation will see a fortune where others see only poverty. An observing man, the eyelets of whose shoes pulled out, but who could ill afford to get another pair, said to himself, I will make a metallic lacing hook which can be riveted into leather. He succeeded in doing so and now he is a very rich man. An observing barber in New York, N.J., thought he could make an improvement on shears for cutting hair and invented clippers and became very rich. A main man was called from the hayfield to wash out the clothes for his invalid wife. He had never realized that it was to wash before. He invented the washing machine and made a fortune. A man who was suffering terribly with toothache said to himself there must be some way of filling teeth to prevent them from aching. He invented gold filling for teeth. The great things of the world have not been done by men of large means. Want has been the great schoolmaster of the race. Necessity has been the mother of all great inventions. Erickson began the construction of his screw propeller in a bathroom. John Harrison, the great inventor of the marine chronometer, began his career in the loft of an old barn. Parts of the first steamboat ever run in America were set up in the vestry of an old church in Philadelphia by Fitch. McCormick began to make his famous reaper in an old grist mill. The first model dry dock was made in an attic. Clark, the founder of Clark University of Worcester, Massachusetts, began his great fortune by making toy wagons in a horse shed. Opportunities They crowd around us. Forces of nature need to be used in the service of man, as lightning for ages tried to attract his attention to electricity which would do his drudgery and leave him to develop the God-given powers within it. There is power lying latent everywhere, waiting for the observant eye to discover it. First, find out what the people need and then supply that want. An invention to make the smoke go the wrong way in a chimney might be a very ingenious thing, but it would be of no use to humanity. The patent office at Washington is full of wonderful devices, ingenious mechanism. Not one in hundreds is of earthly use to the inventor or to the world. And yet, how many families have been impoverished and have struggled for years mid want and woe, while the father has been working on useless inventions? These men did not study the wants of humanity. A.T. Stewart, as a boy, lost 87 cents when his capital was one dollar and a half in buying buttons and thread which people would not purchase after that he made it a rule never to buy anything which people did not want the first thing a youth entering the city to make his home there needs to do is make himself a necessity to the person who employs him according to the boston herald whatever he may have been at home it counts for nothing until he has done something that makes known the quality of the stuff that is in him if he shirks work however humble it may be the work will soon be inclined to shirk him but the youth who comes into a city to make his way in the world and is not afraid of doing his best whether he is paid for it or not, is not long in finding remunerative employment. The people who seem so indifferent to employing young people from the country are eagerly watching for the newcomers, but they look for qualities of character and service in actual work before they manifest confidence or give recognition. It is the youth who is deserving that wins his way uh, to the front and when once he has been tested his promotion is only a question of time it is the same with young women they are seemingly no places for them where they can earn a decent living but the moment they fill their places worthily there is enough room for them 
and progress is rapid. What the city people desire most is to find those who have the ability to take important places, and the question of gaining a position in the city resolves itself at once into the question of what the young persons have brought with them from home. It is the staying qualities that have been in rot from childhood which are now in requisition and the success of the boy or girl is determined by the amount of energetic character that has been developed in the early years at home take up the experience of every man and woman who has made a mark in the city for the last hundred years and it has been the sterling qualities of the home training that have constituted the success of later years don't think you have no chance in life because you have no capital to begin with most of the rich men of today began poor. The chances are you would be ruined if you had capital. You can only use to advantage what has become a part of yourself by your earning it. It is estimated that not one rich man's son in 10,000 dies rich. God has given every man a capital to start with. We are born rich. He is rich who has good health, a sound body, good muscles. He is rich who has a good head, a good disposition, a good heart. He is rich who has two good hands with five chances on each. Equipped? Every man is equipped as only God could equip him. What a fortune he possesses in the marvelous mechanism of his body and mind. It is individual effort that has accomplished everything worth accomplishing in this world. Money to start with is only a crutch which, if any misfortune knocks it from under you, would only make your fall all the more certain.